welcome to everybody again for another uh, publication of Crosstalk. Um, we are continuing this evening with the pattern that we started last week, where we are going to be exploring the Bible story for the upcoming Sunday. And again, our hope for this is just to give y'all a way to engage deeper on Sunday mornings. You can come uh, prepared already, thinking about that story. And uh, that's one part of it, is a chance for you to prepare. The other chance is a little bit mm -hmm. selfish on our part. These stories are so big. They're huge. And there are so many themes involved. We're not going to be able to talk about all those on a Sunday morning. So this is a chance to sort of bring up with you some of those other big topics um, that we're not going to be able to hear about mm -hmm. in the sermon. So last week, we began by talking about the story of Adam and Eve, and we talked about Genesis chapter 2. We did not go to Genesis chapter 3. We stayed in Genesis chapter 2. Um, and then this week, we're moving on to um, the next really, really big story in Genesis, and uh, the next really big character, and that is Abraham. Abraham. So on Sunday, we're going to be looking at Abraham, who mm -hmm. is a life... He was shaped by faith. Life shaped by faith. Yeah. And an encounter with God. I think maybe we put, sometimes, you know, faith is kind of amorphous. It's like everybody's got faith in something. But it's Abraham's faith and confidence in this creator God that mm -hmm. really makes the difference. Yeah. So um, that's where we're headed. And uh, Dad, you've been spending time mm -hmm. with Abraham over the past couple of weeks. Um, I guess my first question to you is, um, Abraham's story is big. It covers chapter 12 in Genesis to chapter 25. Right, right. So what part of Abraham's life are you going to pick up on and talk about on Sunday? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a big story, as you said, from chapters 12 to 25. Abraham lived 175 years. Uh, so there's a lot of ground to cover in that. Um, we're going to be looking specifically at chapter 15, but we're going to have to go back a little bit uh, to chapter 12 because that sort of provides a foundational understanding of what's going on in chapter 15. And so in uh, chapter 12, we read, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So that's the, the foundational promise. Now there's some stuff that goes on before, but this is kind of the, the promise that God makes to Abraham. And I think, you know, most of us can at least realize and understand that the Bible has some promises for us and God, you know, is supposed to make promises for us. And so, you know, this idea of promise isn't foreign, um, but that's the foundational promise. Yeah. One of the themes that we have been talking about in our Psalm Bible study is that the God that we meet in the scriptures um, it is one of the defining features is this God chooses to relate with the stuff he's created in these promised relationships. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's just a, a foundational part of who God is. Yeah. Um, so chapter 15 kicked us back to chapter 12. Right. And chapter 12, it in some ways, seems like a hard break in Genesis. We've been having all these sort of, you know, uh, well, the word that, that a lot of Bible commentaries who tend to be a little bit cynical would use is mythical. Right, right. It's sort of prehistory. And then all of that stops and you get this, what you read. Right. There was a guy named Abraham. Um, so in some ways there's a break in chapter 12. But in the same way that chapter 15 kicked us back to chapter 12, chapter 12 is also kicking us back to earliest parts of Genesis, right? It, it really is. And, and so we get back, um, you know, where does the story of Abraham begin? Well, in, in many ways, it begins in the Garden of Eden. And there are going to be some themes that reappear uh, in 
Abraham and Sarah's relationship that appear in the, the Garden of Eden story. So it's really good to know the creation story, know a little bit about the fall and where human beings go wrong. And then uh, we're gonna find out that uh, God is determined to rescue creation. And, he, and he's, he's gonna have a family, it's gonna be Abraham's family through which he's gonna do that. But uh, God's determination is to redeem creation and then to redeem the peoples of the earth as well. So this is sort of a, a global uh, recovery that God has in mind beginning right after the fall. And so as you move away from um, uh, the, the Garden of Eden story, you'll begin to find tables of nations. And so the biblical writers are aware that uh, the human race is, is expanding um, and, and populating the earth. And uh, so the biblical writers begin to give us these, these tables of nations. And then it comes uh, out, I think, in the promise to Abraham, where God says to Abraham, through you, Abraham, all of the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. So all of these peoples that are going all over the place are gonna be blessed through Abraham and there's gonna be a recovery of creation. So in one way, while I think you know, this story can be really personal to all of us, you know, we all face disappointments, we all need faith, um, but we need to keep this larger framework always in mind that, that through our faith, God is working in something much larger. Yeah. So um, we're going to come back to a lot of those themes that yeah. you mentioned in, in over the next little bit as we're talking. But um, I am really interested in the continuity uh, between the story of Adam and Eve in creation and the story of fall and then the, the introduction of Abraham. It seems like uh, one of the, the ways that... Uh, Again, you want to you often presented with it is that Abraham is a strange break that brings us into real history. Um, but the the story in between is important. So um, Adam and Eve kicked out, get kicked out of the garden. Mm -hmm. They have children. Mm -hmm. Things don't work out with their children. Um, uh, as Cain kills Abel, um, and we get these stories about the increasing brokenness of humanity. Cain kills Abel, and that's a horrible thing. Um, but uh, Cain pleads with God, don't let the people kill me, whoever these people are. Um, and Cain gets married to whoever this person is. Um, we get the feeling that, um, as you said last week in the sermon, men and women are doing what men and women do. Yeah. And as God said, be fruitful and multiply, and that's happening. And the world is being populated, and uh, human beings are spreading out the way that God intended but the, the brokenness that started in the garden is also spreading. Right. So Cain kills Abel, and then we're introduced to one of Cain's descendants named Lamech, yeah. who is even more violent yeah, just and a, angry than Cain. Like a lot of people in our culture today, yeah. we can read about Lamech and go, oh, okay, yeah, I know this yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we're introduced to the generation, Noah's generation, mm -hmm. where God laments is sorry that he made people because they've gotten so rotten but uh, the theme the big theme in noah is not just god's judgment but also god's uh loyalty to um to creation um god's desire to not let go of creation um god has the chance to destroy it all but he doesn't mm -hmm. i found one person and I will use that person's family, and, and we'll see if we can uh, get on better standing. So we have Cain and Abel, Lamech, Noah. Then we come to the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. And again, we find God is trying to be patient. God is trying to, he left Abraham or uh, Noah with good promises. Um, and people are screwing it up again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're refusing to spread out over the earth like God asked them to. Instead, they're clumping up in one place and trying to build this tower. And you get the feeling that God's just shaking his head, like, what do I have to do to make you do what I asked you to do? God confuses them and spreads them out. So you do have this narrative. Things fell apart in Genesis, but God has been working to reclaim. God is not letting go of what was lost. Yeah. You and know, then we come to chapter 12. And then we come to chapter 12. And, you know, one of the, the things, too, 
we were talking about a little bit earlier, Nathaniel, was that, you know, the, the biblical writers are giving us um, highlights of all the unfolding of these centuries. They're not, you know, they're not giving us the everyday details of, you know, what, what's just going on in the world. Um, it would be impossible, I think, for a book to hold all of that, and many of the day-to-day -day activities are rather mundane and don't carry a lot of freight anyway. So uh, what they're telling us are these, these large events, these large stories that give meaning to everything else that's happening. They're representative and they're giving meaning to the everyday life and explaining it to us. And I think, you know, these tables of nations are, are important. <clears throat> Uh, in that they are a recognition uh, that human life is being extended across uh, the, the world and, and things are happening. And I don't see any reason to take that as anything but uh, just historical memory. I mean, this, this is what God is doing through time. Right. So um, we have, uh, again, these stories of where people are coming from and you know, I think in years past, these had probably been abused and if nothing else, misunderstood and, and made ridiculous. But Noah has three sons. Yeah. And we're told that from Noah's three sons, all the families of the earth are descended. And Abraham is one of them. Abraham is one of them. So, you know, we... Uh, but underneath that is this connection. It, um, on the one hand, you, we can read the story of Abraham and Abraham's faithfulness and we rightly should understand it as the beginning of God's special relationship with special family. When we get to Exodus, God will remind them that even though the whole earth belongs to me, you will be my special people. Mm. So Abraham is the beginning of that, but Abraham is also a looking back to all of the people who are all related and who all belong together and who God really wants to bring all back into the fold. Exactly. And, and Abraham himself will be the progenitor of some of the nations of the earth that are not the family of uh, Isaac. I mean, he's got uh, Ishmael, uh, who is born through Hagar. Um, he'll have Keturah, another wife, and other sons will be born uh, to her through whom great people groups will be formed. And then the grandson Esau has his own uh, family that sort of started. So Abraham is really connected with these families of the earth. And as a matter of fact, when we sing the song, Father Abraham, he really did have a lot of children. One of them was going to be the child through whom the promise would be extended. But that promise, too, has to do with the recovery of creation and the blessing of the nations of the earth. Yeah. So, again, you know, in years past, um, that story about Noah's three sons and the nations that are born out of him, I think, has been used to... Um, you know, uh, justify the bad ways that we treat other people. Yeah, racial stereotypes. Racial stereotypes. Yeah. I think the more important message, though, is that we actually all belong together because we all come from the same place. And um, when we go back to chapter 12 and that original promise that God makes with Abraham, it makes it clear that God is thinking about everybody. Everybody, absolutely. And you know, and that, that phrase that uh, C.S. Lewis popularized, but I think it's, it's just, it's beautiful, it's appropriate, it's biblical. You know, the, the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. We're, we're all, you know, sons of Adam or daughters of Eve. That's just who we all are and we all belong together. Yeah. So, and we can go ahead and start, stop beating this horse, but it's a fun horse to beat. Um, this, original call that God God gives to Abraham it is for Abraham it is for the future mm -hmm. um, but it also looks back to the past Abraham I'm going to make you into a great nation I will bless you and make your name great you will be a blessing bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and then all people on earth will be blessed through you um, so that's an important part and maybe a little bit later in the conversation um, we can come back to that idea in our Sunday school, we have been studying Romans, and Paul spends a lot of time in Romans talking about Abraham. And I don't think that that is accidental. Paul has more in, in mind than just Abraham as a man who was willing to say yes to God. Um, but maybe that's the next place to go. We're, we're talking about chapter 15 on Sunday. But the story starts in 12, and um, 12 is important because this relationship begins. Mm -hmm. The 75-year-old Abraham 
um, as, as part of a family who is hails from one of the great greatest ancient cities in the world, Ur. Mm -hmm. um, his father apparently was an um, interesting guy. His father makes his way out of the city and um, in, into another place. Uh, who knows? Some kind of entrepreneur, some kind of free spirit. Um, and Abraham finds himself in the land of Haran, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, north of Israel. I guess that would be, what, northern Syria, eastern Turkey, kind of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turkey. Turkey today. Yeah, so Abraham receives the call there from God. Will you follow me? And Abraham, to this God, says, yes. Yes. And it's the beginning of this relationship. Yeah, yeah. And and so um, we find that um, that God speaks to Abraham, and he's 75 years old, actually, when he when he leaves Haran and goes on down in, into Canaan, where God intended him to go um, all along. So he's, you know, he's going to live to be 175, but he's, he's 75 years old now. So he's, he's lived some years. He's got some uh, years on him. And then uh, I guess as we move on to Sunday, and there's, we'll talk more about this, but he, he, 10 years elapses, you know. And so he's got this promise that he's going to have an heir and he's going to have eventually the, the promise comes around to some land that he's going to give the family. Uh, but for the land to be meaningful, he's going to have to have an heir. Right. So look at this that old thing. You know, we're all going to die and all the stuff that you got is going to have to go somewhere. It's going to have to go somewhere. So we can't talk about Abram, this story, without talking about Abram's wife, who's a part of the story from the beginning, Sarai. Um, and uh, God makes this promise to Abraham, Abram and Sarai, but they have a problem. As a couple, they're unable to have children. In verse 30 of chapter 11, again, this, this 12th chapter isn't a break. It's really a continuation of the story. In 30 of 11, it says, now Sarai was barren and she had no children. Mm -hmm. And so this, this theme of barrenness, she's personally unable to conceive, to have a child. Um, that would move the family into the future. But this barrenness is also, I think, sort of uh, speaks to the environment mm -hmm. that in, in which they're coming from. All of these nations, they really come to nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing much is happening. Mm -hmm. And so barrenness is this thing. So Abraham, Abram, and his wife Sarai are traveling with family, traveling with his nephew. We get the feeling that Abram is, a, is again, a real entrepreneurial he spirit. Is, yeah. Um, and we find that throughout his life, he's always got crazy schemes, and most of them work. Yeah. Um, but connected to, or maybe sometimes opposed to, Abraham's um, entrepreneurial spirit is this relationship he's been called into with this God. Who? This is another interesting idea. It's, we can speculate. How does how does Abraham even know who he's talking to? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that we see unfolding in Scripture, but going back just a minute to Sarai, um, you know, for me, this does take us back to the garden and this side by side. Adam and Eve were created side by side to do something. And Abraham and Sarai, Abram and Sarai are, are called side by side to do something. Abram tries to do it another way through an Egyptian servant doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's this, God seems to insist that this heir has got to come through Sarai. Mm -hmm. And so here they are side by side. And then you have this question of, well, how does, uh, how does Abram, you know, know this is God speaking. I think one of the fundamental um, convictions of scripture is that the word of God has the power to create faith. Mm -hmm. when, when God's word is spoken, God evokes in, in the the one who listens, faith. And so we can't like say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a person of faith. I've done all this. It's like, no, the word of God has come and, and stirred something in us. And I think that's the only reason you and I'll dare get up on a Sunday morning and try to preach is because <laughs> our words are useless. Um, the world is full of chatter. Uh, people are full of talk when they sit out here in the congregation and listen to us. But there's this conviction that comes through Scripture, that comes through the church, particularly through the Protestant Reformation, that the Word of God carries power. I mean, so, okay, how does, how does Abraham know? Well, God's stirring him up. 
Yeah, it, and it does go back to that claim that is made at the beginning of Genesis that God is able to bring stuff out of nothing. By his word. He creates by, by his, his word. word. He creates faith as well as the world. So I'm going to keep going back to Romans just because it's on my mind. But again, Paul is coming back to Abraham for a variety of reasons. And we understand on a basic level that Abraham is faithful. And that's why we need to use him as an example. But it's deeper. In Abraham, God is reaching out to all the nations. That becomes an important part of Paul's idea in Romans. Um, another part of it is this uh, idea that b before Abraham, there was no family. Abraham is a Gentile. Yeah. Um, and it's only by this voice, this call that Abraham hears that he's able to enter into relationship and become the beginning of something. But it is something that's brought out of nothing. Yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, Abraham is not, strictly speaking, a, a Jew. He, he's a Chaldean. He's from Ur. He's a Babylonian is what he is. Yeah. And, and so um, you were talking about him being an entrepreneur. I mean, it's, it's interesting to look at those Sumerian city-states that develop at this time in history. Um, very competitive people. Oh, Lord, yes. Um, uh, very commercial um, the, the culture was competitive. The culture was commercial. Go their back religion. And read the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah, their, their, their religion was uh, um, competitive and uh, producing, you know, exquisite works of art and all of this kind of uh, beautiful materialism. I mean, so th this is the cradle they of where. They were business people. First and foremost, they were business people. I think they would have found uh, American culture um, familiar. Uh, well, really a, a little bit soft, but familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah soft, but familiar. Yeah. But at any rate, I think we digress. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, here's this, this word of God kind of coming to the Gentiles. And so Paul is, is really recovering this. Well, and I think, again, yeah. Paul's idea becomes that this is a met. Paul spends time talking about God's righteousness in Romans. And uh, righteousness implies some sort of agreement. What, it, what agreement is God keeping up? Is it the agreement that God made with Moses and the people in Exodus to give them a land and to be their, you know, be their God? It seems like Paul has in mind this covenant that God's made with Abraham to bless all the nations. Yeah, That's what Paul is really interested in. How is God going to recover not just a special people, but all the people? All the people, yeah. And so... Uh, that, that sort of begins to drive us into chapter 15 because this is where Paul is going to find one of his favorite phrases. He uses it in Romans, he uses it in Galatians, James picks it up as well. Um, so we come to chapter 15 and we sort of fast forward the story. He's got all these promises. The word of God has created faith. Uh, and so Abraham- He's 85 now. He's 85 now, 10 years have gone by. And he, nothing's happened. <laughs> he's been down to Egypt, run into some trouble, tried to make some stuff happen. Uh, God turns the trouble into blessing. He's an incredible guy. Um, he and Lot separate. They find themselves in this beautiful land that's reminiscent of, of Eden. As a matter of fact, um, it says in verse 10 of chapter 13, Locke looked up and saw the whole plain of the Jordan well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zor. I mean, so Abraham's kind of back in, in the garden in a way when he's in Canaan and he's side by side with Sarah and nothing has happened. And so he's 85 now. And we come to, this is the text in 15. And after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So that's that becomes the sort of the 
basis of a lot of Paul's New Testament teaching mm -hmm. and James as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I find that words like that are largely useless because we have no idea what they mean. Exactly. And they carry all this emotional freight. We feel like they ought to be important and we ought to feel something about them, but we don't. <laughs> exactly. So what do, what do you think that means? What does it mean that uh, this interaction that, that God and Abraham have in chapter 15? Um, again, you know, God is, God seems so patient and he, he seems to understand us and know us. And, uh, you know, here, here Abraham is sort of wavering in his faith going, well, you know, maybe you'll give me part of it. But, uh, and we understand why too. I mean, this isn't like Abraham's a weakling or a dummy. He had a conversation with an, a spirit being who he's never seen. 10 years ago and nothing has happened. Right. Fair, it's reasonable to have some questions about this. <laughs> very, very fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so the Lord comes back to Abraham and assures him that the, the promise will uh, be fulfilled. And, and this idea of he trusted and, and, and God counted him righteous, um, I think that is a, a you know, it is by this trust that we enter into this right relationship with God. And for me, righteousness, it, it's, it's a relationship word. Um, will the relationship be maintained? And uh, Abraham trusted God and, and said, yes, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to trust you. I'm gonna believe in this. Your word is causing me to continue to trust you. And God said, okay, we're, we're still in right relationship. What, I mean, add to that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Um, again, I think sometimes we have this idea like our, our job is just to believe really hard in the Bible and God will do everything else. And when we have questions in life, then, you know, that becomes uh, somehow an assault on our faith because we're not believing well enough. And that's not really the picture that we get from Abraham. Abraham is invited into this relationship. Abraham does his best, but he has legitimate questions, so he brings them to God. Yeah. You told me this and nothing's happening, and I'm making plans because I have to do something. And, uh, and you do get the sense that, that God is more than willing to work with Abraham. I understand your concerns. Um, let me offer you my assurance. Um, and Abraham's willingness to continue down this line. It's not, it's not believing, um, it's not believing in a set of facts. It's believing in a way that orders Abraham's life. It orders the choices he's going to make. It orders the way that he's thinking about his future. Um, I will continue to hold out and I will continue to believe that I will have my own descendant and then I will not leave all my stuff to this distant relative. And again, you picked up Damascus. Um, if Abraham is down in the land of Canaan, somewhere in Israel, Damascus is not really close to <laughs> the land of Canaan. Yeah, it's in Syria. <laughs> so it's someone who doesn't even live near him. Um, so it, it is this complicated relationship. And yet, it's that relationship. It's Abraham's willingness to continue to entertain God's call on his life that that i think makes it fruitful and as we continue on in the story this tension you know between god's promise and and abraham's impatience uh, continues to grow um here abraham says i don't have my own descendant god says you're going to have one but then in another five years uh, abraham and sarah still don't have a descendant and Sarah has made up her mind. She's got a plan. If I can't have it, maybe my slave mm -hmm. can have a descendant and we can pass our inheritance on to that. And that's the story of Hagar and Ishmael. And again, God doesn't come back and smack Abraham down and say, you were wrong. You didn't trust me. This is not what I intended. God comes back a little bit later and says, there's going to be another one. Yeah. And going back to what you're saying, the side by side, Abraham and Sarah in it together. There's going to be another one. There's nothing wrong with Ishmael. I will take care of Ishmael. Yeah, he receives a blessing. And, and Hagar and receives a blessing. God they, speaks to Hagar. God in an incredible way. Yeah. Um, and uh, Ishmael becomes the father of a great nation. But, you know, there's... But, again, that uh, God says, 
I made a covenant, I have an idea, and I will make it happen. Just hang in there with me. And I think uh, 15 is also significant for a couple of things that happen. One of them, of course, is this after 10 years, it's like we can all identify with Abraham going, what's up? And, uh, but, but, but God in this, this relationship, God is speaking, but God does a couple of things in this um, chapter 15. One of them we read in the first few verses there. Um, Abraham becomes aware of the stars in the sky. And, and we're not told exactly how or what, but that really speaks to Abraham and strengthens his faith. It's almost as if, you know, the idea came to him, God spoke to him. We're not told exactly how all that happened. But, uh, you know, God says, uh, count the stars, look up into the heavens, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And said, then uh, so shall your offspring be. I mean, God is showing him this, and, and Abraham is going, wow, I mean, if God can do that, maybe. Maybe God can do something yeah. impossible. So you get this sort of inspiration, I think is what some authors call it. Uh, God directed his attention to something that really, really began to encourage him. Yeah. And then again, the, um, going back to this idea of faith and, and it being credited to him as doing the right thing, I guess maybe yeah. is the way you yeah. say it. Um, Maybe even hanging in there. Hanging in there, yeah. And I think, again, the basic idea behind righteousness is God extends an offer. And in our righteousness is our ability to stay engaged. Yeah. And um, the stakes get higher throughout Abraham's life. It begins with, leave Haran, go to the place I'll show you. Um, it turns into, trust me that I'm going to give you an heir. Um, eventually, Abraham will receive circumcision as a sign of this covenant he's made with God. And on the surface, that doesn't seem like a big deal. And you know, we still today, you know, if you have a, a little boy in the hospital, they ask if you want to be circumcised. For a grown man to be circumcised is a different prospect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, this is the stakes are going higher. It becoming maybe a little bit, the, the agreement is becoming more formal maybe. And then um, I guess Abraham's faith comes to its, crisis point maybe um, years down the road after Isaac has been born and God says I want him back right um, and that again becomes the exercise of Abraham's willingness to do what God asks I think you're exactly right and, and um, a couple things again begin to unfold as the relationship though and I think it, in a sense deepens in that um, God really begins to understand or, or has, has understood, but is I, maybe the better way to think about it really is that Abraham is ready now to receive something a little bit more. So God has made some promises, um, you know, about the nations and about Abraham's family. He's given him an inspiration. Just, you know, look at creation and see what I can do. But then the promise moves into something a little bit more serious. It becomes physical in that in chapter 15, um, really odd story, um, God says, you know, split some animals apart and I'm going to appear and I'm going to go through the middle as a smoking pot and a, a burning torch. It's kind of like the children of Israel in the desert, the pillar of fire and the cloud. Um, but um, so th it's kind of strange, but it, apparently this is an ancient Near East custom where you know you lay the animals apart and normally two parties would go through the middle and sort of the demonstration was that if we don't keep our agreement you know we can be laid apart like the animals it's sort of a, a blood sort of covenant uh, enactment seems very strange to us but a couple things about that one is that only God goes through the center and it's almost like God is saying to Abraham Abraham I'm laying my life on the line I've got a lot writing on this. Abe. I've got a lot, lot writing on this, and I am going to be faithful. So here's this, um, it's a sacrament, really. Here's this um, physical demonstration of a, of a spiritual reality. I am going through uh, making a blood covenant with you. And so now we've kind of moved from just a general promise to this covenant. I'm going to give my life for you. 
And when I think of, you know, putting sort of a stake in the material world, when God does that to say, I'm going to be faithful, I mean, it's important to us. It gives us something to go back to. And I think of, it, of that right personally, you know, on, at the cross, you know, God entered into human history and said, I'm making a blood covenant with you. This, this is how important you are. Yeah. And uh, so we have this stake. I think when I, I doubt God's work in the world, when I, I get really in despair, I go, well, well this, this, how far did God go to prove his faithfulness? Well, he went to the cross and then into resurrection for us. But then, as you said, um, um, God is the only one that moves through the animals in chapter 15. But by the time we get to chapter 17, the covenant is renewed and God says, now I want you to move through the animals, mm -hmm. so to speak, in this, this yeah. circumcision. Your turn. Now, you're, you're going to bear my mark on your body. I, I bore your mark in my body. Now, you're going to bear my mark in your body. Right, and, and I, mean, I don't want to be a middle schooler or anything, but again, this is a sensitive place to bear that mark. I mean, would, would a tattoo be easier? C c bring, please, something. Yeah. <laughs> something other than this. Yes, this is getting very close. Very and it's getting very close, too, to, you know, this, this idea of, of, of procreation. I mean, it's, it's pointing toward God's faithfulness with Sarah, Sarai and, and Abram. God's going to be faithful, and this is something very close, and... Um, but you're going to bear that mark and, and remember it. So I think those are really sacraments. Um, and even, you know, when we think about baptism and all, I, I think of some of the baptismal rites. They recall, you know, circumcision is part of the, the this New Testament version of this, you know. Yeah, and Paul has these conversations regularly throughout, um, throughout his letters. And it brings us into this mystery of what is the sacrament all about. You know, does getting circumcised or just taking a bath, being baptized, save you? Is it salvific? Mm, yes, no. But when it becomes a sign of this agreement that we have entered into with God, a very real physical cooperation we've entered into, you better believe it becomes salvific. Um, it, it, it's something that's sealed physically for us uh, of this relationship that we've entered into on a new level so i guess some of the the big themes as we draw this to a close would be one uh, it is just that straightforward lesson that you know we have to be patient with god's delays that <clears throat> also plays into the story of chapter 15. god is delaying for larger creational purposes to fulfill his promise to abraham's family or will delay Abraham's delay of, of uh, what, you know, 25 years before Isaac is born. Uh, so we'll be dealing with these kinds of issues, but also this larger global uh, intention that God has and what all of that has to do with our life. So you can understand why there's a lot to talk about. A lot going on with Abraham. But again, like you say, the, those, those big themes, Abraham is setting us up to look for the future um, in the story. What's going to happen with this special family that is born? Um, but but you yeah, just can't let let go of how it's also looking back and and uh, tying us back to that incredible um, uh, uh, loyalty that God feels towards this creation um, that cannot be overlooked in the story of Abraham. And I hope that's encouraging in in this day of. Even, even in the church, so much of, well, this world's just going to blow up, so just hang on. Well, that's not what the story of Abraham tells us. So one of the uh, things that we talked about in our Psalms Bible study this past week, um, the, the topic was on time, and this um, Old Testament idea, this Hebrew idea that God is going to redeem time. And what that means is that our experience, which happens in time, will no longer be marked by periods of up and down and marred by brokenness and death. God's moving it to a place where our experience of time will be good, without question. Um, that is what God is interested in doing. And um, the, the question at the end of the study is, how is the redeeming of time different from the end of time? Mm. God is not interested in ending time. God is interested in fixing time. 
very different ideas. Wow. Come join us Sunday night, Sunday morning. There's so much positive uh, teaching coming from Scripture that is so encouraging here. Well, let me close this as uh, we uh, wrap this crosstalk up. I'll close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the wonder and beauty of creation, and thank you for your determination to redeem it all, including your human creation, in wonder of wonders that you choose a bunch of humans to come alongside of you uh, to be part of that redemption. Help us to, with uh, open eyes, um, see the opportunities and your call to us to be a part of that great redemption by faith in your faithfulness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone.